Welcome to The Third Story. I'm Leo Sidman. I first met Lila Bialy in January of 2020 at the Winter Jazz Festival in New York. She was gearing up to release her album Out of Dust later that spring, and she was full of enthusiasm for the year ahead. You can see a video of that interview on YouTube if you put in my name and hers together. Out of Dust was an album that captured the diversity, emotion, and vastness of her concept. It was in turns introspective and funky, sentimental and forward-looking. It was in many ways the culmination of the journey that had led her out of her native Canada to New York City and then back again. Because I'm also sad, sugar. Because I feel so bad, sugar. So I can just forget, sugar. Because my mind is sad, sugar. Because I'm lonely still, sugar. Because there's a hole to fill, sugar. Because it don't cost much. After spending years living in New York, she had moved to Toronto to raise her son, along with her husband, drummer and producer Ben Whitman, who she met when the two of them were working with the singer-songwriter Paula Cole. Lila had established herself in New York as a reliable and sought-after collaborator. She worked with Sting, Chris Bode, and Suzanne Vega, among others. After moving back to Canada, she began focusing more on her solo career, and it paid off. In 2018, she won a Juno Award, that's like the Canadian Grammys, for Vocal Jazz Album of the Year. And she became the host of the popular radio show Saturday Night Jazz on CBC2. I always got the impression that part of her particular challenge seemed to be in deciding how to focus her attention and choose a lane. She had a lot going on and she had a lot of voices in her ear telling her how she should proceed. And as we know, you can't please everyone. So who should one listen to in that situation? Of course, 2020 turned out not to be her big year after all, because, well, we know why. She released Out of Dust in spite of pandemic closures and deferred tour dates, and then she reassessed. Eventually, she set about making her next project, one that she had been thinking about for a long time, built around a collection of songs from the Great American Songbook that were requested by her fans. After trying for so long to decide who she should listen to, she ultimately decided to listen to her audience. She open-sourced the repertoire and let the listeners pick the set list. She calls the album Your Requests, and it came out earlier this year. Not surprisingly, Your Requests is made up of the kinds of standards that you get when you ask an audience to choose. Just think of a song that a jazz singer might sing. It's probably on this record. You know the old joke, how many singers does it take to sing My Funny Valentine? Apparently all of them. Well, Lila Bialy added her name to that list, too. My funny Valentine Sweet comic Valentine You make me smile with my heart The album, which includes songs like Blame It On My Youth, Corcovado, and Autumn Leaves, could have easily drifted into the canon of Forgotten Standards records throughout the ages, but Lila made sure to bring the arrangements into her world. I went to go see her play in Paris last month. She was joined by her husband, Ben, on drums and her longtime bassist, George Kohler. And we had originally intended to speak backstage after the show, but the night got away from us, as is wont to do, so we spoke via Zoom a couple of days later. Me from a hotel room in France, she from her home in Toronto, the day after she got home from her tour. And what was originally intended as a short chat turned into a more sprawling conversation about her career, what it's like being married to her closest collaborator, motherhood, loyalty, leaving New York, leaning into limitations, and what she calls renewing her vows to the music. Third-story.com is the place to go to sign up, subscribe, and visit the archive. You know this, hundreds of conversations, including friends and contemporaries of Lila's like Joe Laurie, Kurt Elling, Duchess, and many more. The third story is made in collaboration with WBGO Studios. Visit wbgo.org studios to find out more about all their award-winning content. Then it's patreon.com slash thirdstorypodcast to renew your vows to this project. And finally, I'll be on the road in the Midwest at the end of August and early September. Visit leosidron.com slash live to see my dates. And if you're anywhere nearby, come say hello. Here's me and Lila Bialy talking it down last month. Hello, hello. Hi, Leo. How are you feeling? Are you in total jet lag mode? You know, yeah, we're tired, but we're happy. You know, Ronnie Scott's was amazing. So that was a, a nice way to end. Do you have any sense of clarity in the fog of the return on what the tour was like? Well, it's interesting because, of course, I'm Canadian. You would think that my primary audience, you know, exists in Canada. I'm based in Toronto. But 
things have, have really been building for me in Europe, and that's in large part to my partnership with the German jazz label ACT. And uh, we had packed houses all across Germany. It's always invigorating to get out and connect with fans live and in person. To me, that's where the music really comes to life. I love being in the studio uh, and there's an energy in that space as well. But to me, the real action is on stage. You talk about in your show, you sing about being a mother, your family, you travel with your husband in the band. What do you do about childcare when you go on the road? Yes. Yeah, so usually we bring Josh along. Josh is our son. He's 12 turning 13. And he loves to come along. He is so down for the adventure. And he's been to Europe several times as a result, even in his young life. But this time around, we had to leave him home with a sitter who he loves. She's like a family member. Uh, and also some dear friends, Josh's godparents took him over the weekend. We were gone for about 10 days. And that's about as long as we would want to push things. But he loved it. He was in his glory with mom and dad away. I'm sure he took full advantage of there being a different set of rules in place while we were gone. I want to talk about the music a little bit because you are such an accomplished songwriter. I'm so envious of your songwriting. And Aww. yet you chose to make a record of standards and not even particularly deep cuts. I mean, really, the classics. Yeah. So why did you decide to do that? And why was now the time to do it? It's been a long time coming. I wanted to do it on my terms, Leo. I've had label and team members for probably 15 plus years now saying to me, you got to make a standards record. You know, that's what the public wants. It's what radio wants. And I just, I didn't want to do it because it was what was expected of me. I wanted to do it when I felt that it was something that my followers and my fans would enjoy because, you know, yes, we make music for ourselves as musicians, I suppose, right? The creative process is very personal. But again, for me, it's, it's ultimately for the people, right? You know, whether original songs or familiar fare. And I decided to make it more interesting by asking people what they wanted to hear. So I put it out to my social media community hmm. and, uh, and 150 requests came in and I whittled it down to the 10 that made the most sense to me as a body, as a collection. Um, and there's actually a little bonus single that'll come out in a few weeks um, that didn't make it on onto the record, but we recorded it and I'm, I'm pleased with it. It just somehow felt a little bit like it was a stranger in the room. Yeah. And so your request was born and this was volume one. I decided to give it the focus of the great American songbook. It felt like a really logical place to begin a bit of a full circle moment, because of course that's where I started when I first dipped my toes into the jazz pool 20 years ago, I was learning autumn leaves. I was learning bye bye blackbird, blame it on my youth. I mean, Pretty much all these songs were familiar to me already. And it was really fun to see what we could come up with. And it's been really interesting to see how these songs are evolving and taking shape in live performance. Pack up all my caramel, here I go, singing low. Bye bye, black girl. When you bring whatever the material is into your world, it kind of inevitably ends up sitting in this space that's in between genre or defiant of genre and category where <laughs> it it could be pop adjacent or jazz adjacent, sort of lives in this middle space. And I think that that's probably served you well in this project because you're not doing sort of traditional swinging like versions of these tunes that we know so well. You brought them into a space that fits nicely with your original material as well. Thanks for saying that. You know, I have to admit that I was really nervous going into this tour because there's such a deep connection to the original songs, obviously. And there's also a deep connection to the pop tunes that I've done over the years. The lyrics of those songs and the stories behind them have just really buried their way into my heart. But what I what I loved about seeing how the standards kind of stacked alongside those tunes was just 
people just love the classics, you know, they're like, they're timeless for a reason. And so I, yeah, it was, it was really delightful to see how they counterbalanced and complemented our existing material because yeah, I, I was nervous. I, I, and initially when we, we gave them a bit of a test run in Toronto and what we had done at uh, this pre-release concert here in my current city was we, we mostly did your requests. And I'll tell you that about three quarters into the show, I was like, this is feeling a little lacking in depth. Like just the storytelling even between songs. Yeah. I didn't have much to say. And so finally I just turned to the boys and without even, you know, verbalizing it to them, I just launched into the story behind my original song, Satellite. And I just felt, it felt so good to inject that song and to bring a little more heft and depth from a personal place. The engine hums, the crickets sing. My heart takes flight on silver wings. The radio spins a song, but I can't hear you sing along. It goes adi 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 adi. original material, and you would know this as well as a writer, it's going to be more personal. It has to be by nature. But the standards also are gaining increased depth as we perform them more and more, right? It just it just takes a while to break songs, in, including original songs. And I remember unveiling Satellite for the first time when I just written it, and I, I, I was ready to dump it. I thought it was a total fit. And uh, so I think songs in general it takes some time to inhabit them live, even when we've written them ourselves. I've thought about this a lot and asked singers about this, How, especially with songs that have been either interpreted by so many, never mind the, of the greatest singers who ever sang, but just so many before us, you know, knowing that if you sing Autumn Leaves or My Funny Valentine, you know, that hundreds and thousands of people have tried to embody the song. Yeah. And to have it kind of belong to you is ultimately a process that I don't, fully understand yet the falling leaves drift by my window the autumn leaves of red and gold I see your lips The summer kisses The sunburned hands I used to hold But I guess that is a question that I wanted to ask you because I heard you say from the stage the other day and I've found myself saying this also, I, you know, I'm a songwriter. I'm actually a songwriter, but we're going to do some songs now that I didn't write. And it's like almost having to, <laughs> I don't know, make, explain something before you launch into it. Yeah. And I wonder what has to happen in order for us not to make any disclaimer before we play, you know, what we're going to play. Yeah, that's a really good question because I will never take ownership of these songs. I'm a visitor that I did not build these songs. I am... I don't want to use the word rent, renting them, <laughs> but but it's like I'm living inside of them. And that to me is a great privilege. You know, I don't mean to make it overly precious, but in some ways I feel like I have to, it's almost like I'm saying I'm visiting, I'm passing through, but I'm also trying to do something meaningful while I'm there, right? And, and to bring something fresh and new and interject something personal and unique that does in some ways make those tunes that I didn't write my own. But you could never, one can never make the same claim to them that one can their original songs, right? So I don't know that the disclaimer needs to be there. And I think over time, I won't feel the need to draw that distinction. I think it will just be implied. Yeah. And then you just allow the songs to 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 the original and covers to kind of cohabitate and, yeah. 
and just be together in the mix when it's all part of a show that an artist is bringing the artist is the common uh, is the thing that, that 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 sort of glues that all together and it's nothing new i think for jazz musicians yeah and what i've found to be really interesting is occasionally someone will will actually assume that a song is mine that isn't if yeah. i don't introduce it and uh and that's kind of fun because because then that in some ways then while that might appear fraudulent you realize well no then i'm doing something right if if it fits so well within the scope of a show that includes some genuine original material then 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 that's good you know there's again there's some something cohesive happening yes. between the original material and the covers yeah yeah you know you said the word renting but the word that kind of comes to mind right now is almost like a custodian of the songs right like mm, at, oh that's a great word you know you're taking care of them for the time that you sing them there's privilege there and there's responsibility um you know and again not to be overly precious about it because I, I often try to have also like a uh, a playful spirit when I when I come to these songs and, and not get bogged down by the weight of decades of you know that this thing has been around for decades, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, it's it's fun to see how these songs can be also freshened up again. Like I, I've also had people say to me, you know, I, I kind of don't like this song. I've heard it too many times, but actually, you've brought it into a new life for me, and now I'm enjoying it again, and that's. That's a thrill to me also because um that's what you want too right if, if people people have become sort of bored with something because they've just heard it too much um and then they go oh okay well now now i'm hearing it in a new way i would say in some ways it's, it's part of my mission as an arranger also yeah you know i was really struck by your sense of arrangement and just your strength as a piano player and i think we think singer and maybe particularly female singer and so mm -hmm. you get sort of placed in that box yeah and you know but your piano playing is not trivial i mean it is a big <laughs> part of what you do do you think of your piano playing as just kind of being in the service of being able to deliver the songs or do you think of yourself as a piano player yeah i, I used to think of myself more as a piano player when i was in my 20s like in, at college and and fresh out of college and over time i've begun to feel a little bit like an imposter in the jazz space and increasingly was always giving you know, farming out solos to everybody else on stage and never playing a solo myself and always kind of apologizing to the band like <laughs> you know and and in in touring this material as a trio oh my gosh leo if i was terrified about one element it was the fact that i would be the primary soloist or one of mm -hmm. the primary soloists on stage and so I just eventually had, had to go, okay, well, no, no excuses, yeah. right? Like if we were at a stage in our uh, careers where you can't get on stage and be apologizing, like yeah. it just, it doesn't work. I have thought of the piano increasingly as kind of a means to an end, just part of the arranging process. And, and then I'll have somebody else come in and take care of the blowing, the improvising. And then I don't have to worry about that, but um, yeah, I've had to really reconnect with my voice as an improviser at the instrument. And so in that sense, you have to own that you're a player. Come on, I revere Jeffrey Kieser. I revere Brad Meldow. I revere Oscar Peterson, it, you know, and I, I can't compare, you know, with those greats, but I'm me and I have a unique approach on the instrument and that's okay. That's legitimate too. Um, so I'm trying, trying to just, um, embrace that more. I relate to that on so many levels and I am still farming out all my solos in my sh no. show. There's so many of them. So, <laughs> and I, and I actually thought about that just on a personal level. When I saw your show, I thought, would I have the courage to go out? Because when I perform my songs, I usually do it on guitar and, and, and to do it without a soloist, which is what you've had to do. But, but what I, what I thought again was like, as we know it's true and we hear it over and over again that limitation is actually is strengthening and so much creativity comes through limitation and having to tour as a trio, you know, sort of force your hand or force your hands in this case. And, <laughs> and uh, what we make out of that limitation is often the source of so much creativity. So I, I, I think that's what you're talking about is not having the option sort of led to you stretching out more as a piano player. Yeah, um, I, I definitely grew over the course of the tour and not just in terms of the level of playing, but 
most importantly, the level of confidence and ownership, which really is most of the battle, I think. It's perception, right? I trust my my bandmates if it's just not working. Like if I'm getting up there and 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 really, you know, kind of making a fool of myself night after night or sort of degrading the product or the potency of the show, I trust they would tell me. I have been advised a couple of times, um, you know, when I performed in New York, I've had some folks sort of pull me aside and say, oh man, I'd love to hear you with, uh, with, a, with a piano player. Like, like, you know, bring in somebody to play piano, have Taylor Agusti or, you know, do what Gretchen Parlato does and, and get up there and just sing. And that's great. Um, and I'm I'm kind of intrigued by, by that idea. I've been thinking about doing a duo project where I work with different piano players and I just sing. Thought that could be kind of cool, but conceptually, as a performer, I think generally speaking, it's important for me to be behind the piano. I mean, this does speak to the other side of the coin, right? Which is on the one hand, maybe you've been avoiding stepping out as a piano player when it comes to soloing. But on the other hand, we also become, you know, accustomed to having our security blanket instruments yeah. when we perform, right? Mm -hmm. Where, well, you know, I'm singing, but I'm also here playing the piano, dig me in my, you know, check me out. And so, you know, you don't have to fully assert yourself that sort of be totally vulnerable without the the aid of the of the instrument, which I think also happens to people who sing and play. Yeah, yeah, that's it's interesting because when I was brought into Chris Bodie's band mm -hmm. and Billy Childs was on piano, who's a hero of mine, that was really I didn't couldn't even figure out what to do with my hands mm -hmm. when I was standing center stage. That was one of the most difficult things. I felt so exposed. And uh I mean this would have been in my my mid 20s, so 15 plus years ago now. And I remember Bill, so Billy Childs then after working just for a very brief period of time with Chris and Billy as part of the organization, Billy um, wanted to produce a record for me, which was incredible. Um, but as part of that album, he, of course, wanted to be on piano. Hmm. And instead of going, wow, I love that idea. I was so young in my kind of in establishing my artistic brand and voice that it didn't feel like the right move. Cause I had the feeling that with Billy, um, you know, in the producer's chair and on piano, just the force of his voice in both capacities, you know, yes, I'm sure we would have made something really special together and boy, would it be fun to try that now. Yeah. But at that time it just felt like it was too much during a formative season. And I thought, uh oh, this might just put me on the map as a singer, which which to me did not feel complete enough. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't want to dilute that. Um, and 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 funnily enough, right around the same time, Bobby Columbi, who who is Chris's producer, he's of Blood, Sweat, and Tears. The drummer of Blood, Sweat, and Tears, yeah. Yeah. So he also wanted to produce a record, and he had me meet with the Tal Wilkenfeld, the great young bassist. She's mm -hmm. now kind of singer-songwriter. And Vinny Kalaida. Mm -hmm. So I got together with the two of them, and he envisioned me as like a Hiromi. Mm -hmm. He pictured me as like a fusion pianist composer. And Tal and, and Vinny were way into it. Um, which was like incredibly flattering, but again, it just didn't feel like it was the full picture. So once again, I, I turned down what I think many people would have seen as the opportunity of a lifetime, right? Working with somebody as legendary as Vinnie Kalayuda. Are you kidding? But something about it didn't feel right to me. And even though I was hugely lacking in confidence in so many ways at that time, in my life, I knew enough within myself to say like, no, this is not it. This is not the way that I step out. I like the way you described it as the development season or something like that. The season of yeah, your life. Yeah, did I say formative? Formative season, I mean. yeah. But I like it because it points to a long view of a career. I mean, it's very difficult in the moment to say, this is the season of my career in which I feel that I need to establish something. And in the future, yeah. there'll be another season yeah. when I can then play with that. Absolutely. So there's two things I want to say about that. So the first thing I want to say is that I was quite lost 
really from those early years and I would say 2005, 2006, 2007, when I was having these conversations with Billy Childs and Bobby Columbia. And I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what my sound was, yeah. but I knew what it wasn't. And so in some ways it was saying no to two incredible proposals by people I hugely admired and could do great things for my career that further refined that path to really finding my my sound. And that was why in 2018, uh, 10 plus years later, when I released my self-titled album, mm -hmm. I made it self-titled because that in some ways was an arrival as much as it was a launching point. It was like, okay, here it is. <laughs> <laughs> here is the sound I've been building towards and trying to find for the past 15 years. And now I feel like I can begin to play a little bit. Hey, now, now would you say, now would you say to love the other? Hey, now, would you say, would you say, respect your sister? Hey, now, hey, now, hey, now, she's gonna beat you. Gotta love, 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 it's easy to want it all to come right away. And I mean, I felt it myself. I felt relief as I got older and I wasn't as successful as I thought I might be. And I thought, okay, well now I don't have to be in a hurry to be famous young because I'm not young anymore and I'm not famous. So that's yeah. over. <laughs> but I think particularly as a woman also, I feel like, you know, there's so much pressure placed on you to like kind of break out quickly. And once you sort of pass that, you know, once you turn 30, it's it's kind of like, well, that, that that's not going to happen now. So I, it just requires patience. It requires a lot of patience to, to oh, be able to see your career in seasons like that. It does. And I'm going to thank two really disparate realms for, you know, I think what is a chance at longevity for artists like myself. Mm -hmm. And so the first is jazz. <laughs> jazz is a genre that has never been ageist yes. while it does celebrate and is enamored with prodigies whether it's tony williams or samara joy it is also very much respectful of the elder statesmen and stateswomen and states people and we celebrate uh the shirley horns and the you know sheila jordans and mm -hmm age is like a patch of honor almost yes. right yes and uh it's not at all ageist but the music industry can be however is becoming less so when you think about what's happened with like american idol and the voice and you know we've been charmed by the unexpected heroes mm -hmm. and the and the underdogs right leo i'm gonna you know get real for a moment here you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a woman of a certain age, right? I'm I'm 42, turning 43, and I was told when I was in my early 20s, you're going to be a star. Yeah. And for a moment, you know, okay, well, okay, what well, what does that look like? And I remember opening for Diana Krall when I was 25, mm -hmm. and I sold more CDs than anybody in at the festival. It was Vancouver Jazz Festival that year, and her management reached out to me, but I already had someone I was I had a lot of integrity and didn't want to just abandon my person, even though they couldn't really do much for me, whereas Diana's management maybe could have. Mm -hmm. And so um from a young age, while the idea of fame was appealing, it was also daunting. And I felt like, well, you can't, you don't want to trample your allies along the way to get there. And, uh, you know, I don't know that if signing with Diana's people would have meant been a launch pad to superstardom. I don't know. I don't, you know, um, I'll never know. And that's OK. But now as I grapple with, you know, the fact that I am advancing in years and midlife, I've had some health challenges and, you know, I've had some autoimmune disease and that's impacted my appearance. I, I have alopecia and I have skin challenges. And, and I was saying to my husband, because, of course, you know, for women especially, the visual brand does still often carry weight. And so I've often felt like that's baggage for me when I get on stage. Mm. And as I age, right? I had a really great experience in Bad Meinberg, Horn Bad Meinberg of all places, mm. where it was a tough tour. Trains were canceled and we were schlepping our stuff all over creation. And 
by the time we got on a stage, we were lucky if we'd eaten yeah. and had a chance to get ready and sound check properly. And in Bad Meinberg, we didn't have that opportunity. And so I went on stage totally disheveled and everything now is being documented. It doesn't yes. like everywhere you go, people are filming, they're photographing, you have no control. You can't curate that, that, that stuff. It's out there, um, like it or not. And I remember thinking, I went on stage fearing that the show would have a le like less of an impact because I didn't look the part. And you know what? It was our strongest show of the tour in terms of the audience response. And that brought me so much joy because I was like, you know what? The music transcends what I look like. And I really need to embrace that. It doesn't mean that I don't, you know, go on stage polished um, and sort of branded again to use that word that it's complicated. But at the end of the day, it's the music that people want. And, and again, I think that's for, I think that's true of jazz. Um, and that's something that jazz, that's a gift of the genre. Yeah. Um, uh, because, you know, maybe, I mean, certainly to the Taylor Swift's of the world are, have way more pressure in terms of their, the visual, the visual side. Yeah. I think jazz or no jazz, I think maybe what it also speaks to is an audience's ability to tap into the truth of a situation. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know. It can, it can get pretty kind of hoity toity or, or <laughs> you know, whatever, you know, but like, I think there's a real undeniable truth about walking to, onto the stage disheveled and sharing what you have to share in that moment. And in some ways there's something very compelling about seeing, yeah. that. you know, not seeing somebody who's a mess, but seeing somebody who's, present in the moment when they walk on stage and they're going to deliver whatever that energy is to you. Exactly. And, and, and perhaps as I think you're suggesting, maybe it even served the music. Maybe yeah. there was something about having to just get past the self-consciousness of my, around my appearance yeah. in order to deliver the music authentically, which again, I know I use the word responsibility and privilege, yeah. the words responsibility and privilege a lot, but it is those, both those things when you step on stage you know, we're responsible to ourselves, we're responsible to our bandmates and to the music and the people who've brought us, brought us in and the people who show up. And uh, to me, authenticity is the name of the game. Yes. You've talked a couple of times about, you know, how you lean on your band, you rely on your band to keep you honest in a way. And But of course, in your case, and it is something I, I relate to in my way, not only is your band your band, but generally and it was the case on this tour your husband ben is the drummer also mm -hmm. on the record he didn't play but on the tour he he does and i think he often does work with you so people are witnessing a very intimate musical dialogue that's taking place in front of them also yeah, sure. as tired as i am of being asked the question of what it's like to perform with my <laughs> father i find myself very curious about what is it like to be performing with your husband and, and to be on tour with him and what is that dynamic like in general i'm so attached ben does play on a few songs on the album but you're right larnell lewis who's gobsmackingly good he handles the lion's share and larnell is just stupendous in his abilities and there's a lot of flash, but also brilliance. And he's never self-serving, which is something I, I really admire about Larnell. But Benny, he's my Benny. We've co-produced four albums and a child. <laughs> that's, what, that's how we put it. And there's no replacement for that intimacy of understanding of simpatico. And I think it does translate on stage. So in that sense, while I love to perform with Larnell and still do so um, when he's available, for me... There's nothing quite as powerful as having been on stage with me. And what's so great is that no matter what has happened that day, once George Kohler, Ben Whitman, and I get on stage together, we're home. So there's a sense of home every time we get on stage of the familiar. And what's beautiful is that within the context of that safety and that knowing, we can really experiment and have fun because we, we we have one another's backs. Um, whereas when I've done some tours where I brought in people who were playing the music for the first time and the music just couldn't go to the same places. Yeah. It just, it just couldn't, you know, it was too fresh for everybody. And I really felt like I had to, even when the players were technically superior to me, I still was the one that had to really form the backbone at every show. And, you know, Paula Cole, who I met my, my husband through great singer songwriter, she used to say, you know, 
if there were five people in her band, she'd say, we are five co-pilots on this stage. And I thought that was so generous of her. I, I've always felt the same about my band with, with George and Ben is we are, we're co-pilots. Everybody has an equal share. That's a beautiful thing. Like we're, yeah, it's my name on the marquee, but we are a collective mm -hmm. through and through. I do want to just double back for a second, ask about this question that you brought up when you were just starting out and you had the integrity to stay with your original manager and you said, you know, who knows what would have happened if I had changed and decided to pursue the opportunity of going with Diana Crawls management or, or whatever. Sometimes I wonder if that really is kind of a crucial distinction between the people who do somehow, quote unquote, make it in the way that we perceive whatever that is and those who don't, the kind of like, I don't know, the ones who are just ruthlessly ambitious and the ones who are a little more loyal, you know, and maybe th yeah. th that's a hard way to frame that question. But... I know, I know, because it's not to suggest that somebody like Diana Krall isn't loyal. Right, of course. You know? I mean, I'd love to know her story. I wasn't even thinking specifically about Diana. I mean, you know, Diana, right, right, right. Beyond that, I guess I just mean more like as we look back at the decisions that have been made and think, <laughs> would I prefer to have been a person who was more boldly ambitious or do you still stand by th that decision of saying, no, no, I, I feel like I need to stay loyal to the people who are supporting me in the moment? Well, it's funny you should ask because I was just having this conversation with my bandmates, with George and uh, Ben, because there are a couple of opportunities on the table right now and they would mean a change. Yeah. And I am grappling with the possibility that it could strike the people who I would be leaving as part of my organization, it could strike them as disloyal. Did they help establish a certain foundation? Did they work hard to build a foundation? And then if I leave and, and things really grow and expand, is that person going to feel like, well, they contributed they were there when it was hardest and they put in the hard work and, you know, and at the moment I would say that the, and I'm choosing my words carefully, Understood. but, um, the answer is no, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I, I think that, I think that the, the people and potentially entering the fold, they are now showing up in a time where they're absolutely needed. And yeah. where, while I've had a team in certain areas, I've still very much felt on my, like I'm on my own. Um, and that's been tricky, uh, you know, and looking back on the decisions that I made in years past, I don't regret them. I really don't. Of course, there's a bit of a curiosity, like a natural curiosity about what might've been, but, um, I, I don't know if I had to make those decisions again, I would do that. I do exactly the same thing, but now I am you know, 42. I have a kid. And I have a little bit more of the feeling of not being able to waste any time. Mm -hmm. And so now I'm I'm really putting on my business hat and going, okay, like this person has had 10 years to do X, Y, Z or whatever. And increasingly I've sort of felt like I'm the one. I actually uh, said to a peer the other day that I felt a little bit like, um, is it Sisyphus pushing the rock up the hill? Yes. Yeah, as I get older, I think that that the the driving force to keep creating and keep just moving forward as a musician, which can feel like you're swimming against the tide. I mean, yes. you, do you feel the same? Do you ever feel the same? I feel like we all think that we need to have achieved something before we have our kids. And for some reason, when my daughter was born, I got more motivated and more ambitious. I'm not her mother. You know, I know that that's a, that, that I had a lot of privilege as the father that her mother didn't have because I I just was sort of less physically useful to her for the her first years th than her mother was. But but I mean, mm -hmm. I think just in general that sense of time is precious. I need to make as much use of the time that I have and I need to be focused and so I feel that in the, in my daughter's 12 almost basically the same age as your son um mm -hmm. that I I felt more focused, more clear yeah. about what I want to do. It's been easier yeah. for me to set goals in, in this yeah. stage in my life. So I don't 
feel that I'm swimming against the tide. I actually feel like I, I can see more realistic goals. I mean, maybe my goals are a little more manageable right now. Also, like I, yeah. you know, I'm not setting sort of fantasy someday goals. I'm just like, I, you know, I need an agent <laughs> and I, mm-hmm. you know, it's like, yeah. it's very specific things to just to get to the next, the, get the rock just up, just, <laughs> I just want to get to the next part of the hill and then we'll figure out what to yeah. do after that. Exactly. Maybe that is the better analogy or metaphor rather than swimming against the tide because, you know, I I guess what I mean to say is um, there can be the feeling of drag. Yeah. Like, okay, I now have, as as you described, same with me, I've got more laser beam focus and determination. And part of that is a product of, of parenthood. Yeah. And part of that is a product of pandemic. Yeah. I felt like there was a renewing of my vow. Yeah. The call to be a musician during pandemic, you know, like no other time in my career, including um early parenthood. How so? Oh my gosh, it's because in the absence of being able to perform live and things coming, you know, almost completely to a to a halt instead of just continuing to forge ahead you kind of had to figure out how to get things started again like how to reboot and restart which takes a lot more energy and uh things were going really well for me there there was something was beginning to finally um kind of take off uh in 2019 i just won the juno and there was really great energy for me around my career um, in a way that i'd never experienced in my life yeah, we met in January of 2020 at Wicked Jazz. No, I know, and and so he was on the cusp of releasing Out of Dust, and yeah. I had five months of global tour dates lined up. And Act was super excited about the next album, and then bam, the pandemic hit mid March, and and my record came out March 27th. It was kind of rough, but as colleagues were like leaving music, I had, yes. I had friends who'd been in the business for decades and they were like, okay, well, um, now I'm going to do this or I have to do this. And, and so for me, I realized I was as hungry as ever to get out and share music and keep creating. And now it's something that I don't think any of us will ever take for granted. Yeah. You know, after after what George calls the great pause, <laughs> the great whole note rest in our lives. <laughs> that actually is what He's a calligraphist and he actually has this hilarious, well, beautiful piece of work where it's a piece of a big piece of staff paper. And I think at the title, you know, the title of it at the top is the great pause. And then he's got this beautiful big pause (laughs) in the middle, right? Or like a bunch of pauses right next to each other. um, Just bars stacked with pauses. With becoming parents, you, you know, made the decision to leave Brooklyn and move back to Canada. You know, when I look at your career from my little perch in New York, I think how great to be one of only a small handful of artists of your profile in Canada. You have a radio show and you're you won a Juno and you're a known entity and you're kind of a I mean, maybe the bittersweet image is big fish in small pond. But mm-hmm. but I mean, you, you've established yourself as like a reality in Canada. Mm-hmm. And at the same time. You know, I know so many people when they leave New York, they sort of leave a trail of crumbs behind them, hoping that they're mm-hmm. going to somehow be able to get back there. or They don't want to lose mm-hmm. touch with that, all of that work that they put in there. What is your thinking? And, and I wonder if COVID reframed it or helped mm-hmm. to, to clarify it about being in Canada today. Absolutely. So sort of two sides to it for me. So the first is that when we left New York, You know, I know there's that oft used expression, you can take the girl or the boy or the person out of New York, but you can't take New York out of the person. That's very much my experience to this day. I mean, I call New York the home of my heart. When we moved there, I felt an immediate resonance. I was like, oh, this is my natural habitat. Like this is, this is the pace, the vibration that feels most at home for me or like home. You know, I grew up in Vancouver and I love everything about BC and and now we're in Toronto and I love Toronto too. And Toronto feels it's a stepping stone to New York. But uh, when we left, it was never a leaving. It, as you said, it was a crumb trail. Yeah. And my husband and I were like, well, let's use the money we're saving on rent to fly back twice a month. And right. that's what we did. So I was back in New York at least once a month. Throughout, we moved in in the fall of 2015, and I I was there twice a month 
through the remainder of the year and pretty much throughout 2016. And then it slowed down a little bit in 2017. And then it slowed down a little more in 2018. And then, of course, when pandemic hit, everything came to a screeching halt. But I, you know, you might think that, oh, well, I really was so happy to be away from New York, which I think really experienced the worst of what people did during the pandemic in the thick of it. I mean, the stories I heard were absolutely harrowing. Um, and as someone who has autoimmune disease um, and very severe asthma, that, that's worrisome, right? To sort of be right in the heart of, of things. So I was grateful in a way to be here in Toronto and slightly more sheltered. But I was sad to then have such a clean break from the city that I love so much. And really until we did your requests, every album, um, even since we moved, so the self-titled album, Out of Dust, has been at least 50% recorded in New York, if not more, mm -hmm. in terms of special guests and different layers. And so I've really had a foot in both cities artistically, but now that's less the case and it bugs me. I feel that it's taking me away from myself creatively. Mm -hmm. And so Ben and I are kind of trying to find a way to continue to really remain a presence there and continue to collaborate with the people that we establish with relationships with who either still live there or in some cases they people you know those folks have moved so i'm many amazed have moved. at so oh, many have oh my gosh so many have moved and, uh, and and a number of folks have moved to europe yeah. and you know or now divide their time and so it's, it's a different place but it, it's still to me there's still it's new york is still a place like no other and i do feel that to keep myself really in the game and really in touch with the deepest part of my creative self that I need to be getting back there <laughs> and drinking from that well. Do you see any benefits to launching your career from Canada rather than from New York? Yeah, the grant system. <laughs> Is that it's kind of a lame answer? No, no, it's a real one. That's a, that's a legit answer. It's a sure. real one. It's a legit answer. But I feel behind um, in terms of my trajectory in the U.S., I would yeah. say that's one thing that I really want and need to work on. You know, we were chatting at the outset of this interview about my relationship with Europe, which ACT, the the, the label ACT has really helped yeah. establish. But I, I feel behind in the U.S. I think there's a whole, you know, an audience there for, for, for what I do that is totally untapped. Um, and it's because I just haven't had a presence there, especially since I left, you know? Yeah. Um, and so that's something that I need to really try, try to build. And uh, when I perform every time we're there, it's like, wow, this is, mm. I, I, the, the music really resonates. Uh, and that's, that's exciting to see maybe in certain states more than others or sit in certain cities yeah. more than others, but, uh, it's exciting to me. And, and I, I'm going to say that I, mean, I love, I'm, I'm a dual citizen. Yeah. I love I love the states. I do. Yeah. I know that I know that people have mixed feelings understandably about politics and and there's a big divide there, but I deeply love Americans. Like I just and again, I'm a proud Canadian through and through. I'm a proud Canadian through and through and there's so many things about Canada that I embrace very proudly. Although, you know, that's a big conversation in light of truth and reconciliation and and you know, the the the, the sort of true people who have a true claim this land, the yeah. indigenous people of Canada. So it's very complicated. And now I'm trying to understand the, the true roots of this country. But where the states is concerned, and of course, again, also a complicated history, I feel that Americans, and maybe it's New Yorkers, but I experience this in most cities where we travel, whether in the South or North or, or you know, East, West, there's just a, a sort of an openness and, and a desire to really like Kind of be in the mess together and mm. and and to be close and to experience community and do community it just something about it to me feels a little more immediate and i really like that you know whereas i think i do think canadians we tend to keep more to ourselves you know what i'm saying like you don't necessarily just strike up a conversation with somebody else in line at this at the supermarket mm. whereas in the u.s it's like hey, it's like strange if that doesn't happen I think what you're describing ultimately is the wonder that anyone feels when they go to another place and they're able to see all the beauty in it rather than the stuff that drives them crazy and that they can't wait to get away from. <laughs> 
Because I mean, right. I, you know, I I look at Canada, and I'm thinking, oh my God, this so much so the social safety net and the the support for culture and and also just the scale of it. I mean, I think like on the one hand, when you're in Canada, you think, no, I got to get back on the other side. The that's where all the stuff is happening. And I you know I look at Canada and I just think, how nice would it be to just have this sort of container that I mean, it, physically it's very large, but like it's a little more manageable in terms of trying to even figure out where do I fit? How do I stack up? How do I make something? And even on stage the other night in Paris, you were talking about all these gigs, you know, oh, we were playing in this little place and then this happened and we were playing, I was doing this gig here and then this person and this thing happened. And I, and I was like thinking just how much access you have to performance within the world of Canada. Yeah, it's, it's pretty awesome. I mean, and again, I, I would never ever want to um, none of this is a diss towards Canada. I mean, it is my home and, and, um, and it is, it, it, you know, I am a product of this place and I'm so grateful for it and the beautiful communities that exist across the country. Um, you know, and, and there's sort of these micro communities, but then there's the, 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 the big city community at large, um, that is returning to its sort of beautiful yeah. um ah, what's the word i'm looking for like there's that global village thing mm. uh that co covid kind of you know, disrupted for a while but you know when we when we do the the jazz festival circuit for example it's just so much fun yeah. to see your colleagues from across the country yeah you know and cross paths with them at festivals and and you get to have these wonderful moments of connection and and sometimes it's even collaboration, right? Oh my gosh, hey, let's why don't you sit in on this tune? You're yeah. you're here with your band and you've got an earlier set. Well, join us on our set. And and it is a beautiful community. Um, but culturally in general, um, I think Canadians can be a little more uh sometimes separated mm. and less in the mix with one another. But maybe that's just my impression, you know, and maybe that's again like it's a bit in New York, I think some people speak to a New York that is yeah. very sort of segre segregated musically. Um, and I I didn't have that experience at all. I felt that New York was where I was able to shed the box that I'd been put in, in Canada. Hmm. And it didn't matter that my jazz was pop laced. Yeah. You know, and Jeff Keezer, a hero of mine, and Chris Potter, Fred Hirsch, Kurt Elling, like they'd be in the audience where yeah. I was performing, which was just blew my mind, just digging a type of jazz that is not necessarily like middle of the road and and uh, and accepting of it. And in that sense, I felt I was really given permission to explore fully my own sound, my own voice. Whereas I, I did I did kind of get put in a bit of, of a box here mm. before I left here in Canada. And that was hard. Lila Bialy, thank you for sharing all of this with me today and for letting this turn into a hour in conversation instead of the 10 minute one that I had promised you originally. Oh, it's been so rich. I mean, I feel like you and I could go on yeah. um, and thank you for taking the time. And I would have as many questions for you as you had for me. And what a, what a great dialogue that no doubt will continue in, in the months and years ahead. I really hope so. Thank you so much. Thanks, Leo. There she was, my friends, the lovely Lila Bialy. What a sweet talker. I'll be back in your headspace again before you know it. Until then, I'll talk to you soon. This has been a WBGO Studios production. To learn more about WBGO Studios award-winning podcasts, special concerts, live streams, and more, visit wbgo.org slash studios.